we're going to go on record and say Ohio versus Carl Whitney. This is 18 1 through 0 6. And we have uh, another witness that's ready to go today. Uh, Mr. Hyatt, I believe you uh, have your expert uh, ready to testify this morning. Last night when we left, we had been discussing some of the jury instructions and some of the um, uh, argument and discussion um, was revolving around the, um, the jury instructions and the law uh, regarding uh, self-defense, which the instructions uh, can uh, be given under what circumstances. And I briefly spoke with the uh, parties this morning, uh, that being uh, this council, to make sure that the issue would be framed up uh, appropriately for um, argument this morning. And in discussing that, uh, I have indicated that we've been looking at it from one perspective, that being um, a causation um, and a responsibility then followed by a self-defense uh, argument, and we framed that up last night. And asked the parties to consider it looking at it the other way, the self-defense argument first, and then the causation issue second. Uh, and in that discussion, it was just to make sure that the parties, uh, counsel for the parties, understood some of the considerations that the court is going to be listening for in that argument. Uh, at, as uh, I informed you of that, we had a little bit of uh, exchange back and forth to clarify the issue, and I think the parties agreed that it might be best if we go ahead and hear uh, the testimony first, see how that plays out, how it develops as far as the uh, presentation, and then take the argument regarding that after the testimony. And I, I kind of felt like that might be the best approach, especially since your expert is here and ready to go. I mean, as soon as your associate's here, we'll, we'll be ready to start. Um, does that uh, seem to make sense, Mr. I for you? Yes, Your Honor. In, you know, even without my associates, we're ready to start, Judge. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, you had also indicated that uh, you had some extra uh, research that you were doing last night, some case law that you may want the court to consider. Since that's not here uh, quite yet, and I will need to take a little bit of time to actually read it, contemplate it, put it into the fact pattern that we're dealing with, and then have argument, it would make more sense to just go ahead and take that uh, witness. Uh, Mr. Uh, Spryzak, uh, how do you feel about to handle it in that uh, fashion? I'm comfortable with that, George. All right. So with that, then uh, I am actually ready to go ahead and take that witness. I don't mind waiting. Do you know where uh, or how much longer your associate will be? Uh, he's on his way, Judge. It should be within, I'd say, 15 to 30 minutes, Judge. Okay. Well, uh, if it were the uh, uh, 10 to 15 minute range, I'd be okay with that, but not going into the 30. And I'm okay. I don't, I don't need, you know, I don't need him at this particular moment. Yeah, okay. So. I just yeah. understand that, you know, sometimes there's some back uh, support going with case law details, things like that. Okay. All right. Well, if there's uh, no other reason to wait, let's go ahead and uh, uh, I just want to get out. I think I'm actually ready to have everything here. All right. So, uh, April, we'll go ahead and bring the, uh, the jury in. You can be seated until uh, further notice. We have, uh, this building was built somewhere around the 1870s, um, and it's gone through about four or five uh, remodelings, if you will. The jury room back there is still on the heat from the 1870s, so uh, we're getting down to 28 last night. That room's very cold, so they were out in the hallway um, keeping warm. We're gathering the jury back up, so it just came in. Judge, is it okay if I just went through the rest of the yeah, Absolutely. Thank you. In here, and we open the windows to let the warm air in and the cold air out. 
you're experiencing that because it's fall, so it's in between, doesn't know what to do. Um, but thank you for your patience. Uh, and yes, if you do have to step out of the room to get warm, if we can't get it fixed with portable heaters and everything, uh, what you did to go outside stay warm is virtually acceptable. So thank you. Uh, but we are ready to proceed with uh, the testimony. Um, so Ms. I will defer to you for the uh, next witness. Yes, sir. You want me to go for you? Judge, uh, we call Dr. Rapp, but I'm going to go outside again. Yes, thank you. Just list your full name for the record. Stephen M. Rapp, MD. Uh, where are you employed, Dr. I'm self-employed. I'm a neurological surgeon in private practice. Uh, uh, how long have you employed at that position? About 38 years. Um, where, did you, where did you receive your education, Dr. My undergrad was at Wayne State University, uh, medical school at Wayne State University. Then I did three years of general surgery training at the Detroit Medical Center. Detroit Medical Center, and then another five years in neurological training uh, at the Detroit Medical Center. And that's on um, uh, Detroit, Michigan, sir? Yes. And you went to medical school? At Wayne State School, Wayne State University School of Medicine. Okay. And uh, what did you graduate with, sir? A high honors. Okay. And, uh, what was the degree that you graduated with? I graduated with a BS in biology with high okay. And um, you ended up going to medical school? That is correct. Okay. Did you graduate with an MD from medical school? MD from medical school. Okay. Um, are you licensed to practice in this as well? Yes, I am. Okay, well, and where is that? State of Michigan. Um, do you hold any board service? Yes, I'm board certified in neurological surgery and in pain management. Are you a member of any professional associations? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the Congress of Neurological Surgery, the Association of Neurological Surgeons, the Michigan State uh, Neurosurgical Society. And we will hold that against you in the state of Ohio. I just uh, was realizing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you please explain to the jury, uh, Dr. Rett, what is a neurosurgeon? A neurosurgeon is a physician who operates on diseases of the central nervous system. So that would be brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves. Can you tell me, Dr. Rett, about your work experience? Uh, you've had extensive 38 years, you said, correct, sir? So uh, I've been in the one location for 38 years. Uh, I've been the past chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at St. Joseph Mercy of Oakland, one of the hospitals that I worked at. For the last 38 years, I've covered emergency rooms as part of my responsibilities at many of the local hospitals. Uh, so I think I've seen an uh, extensive amount of head trauma, head injuries, subdurals, which is the main topic here, strokes, and things of that nature. And that was going to be my next question. Uh, you, you've seen trauma, uh, head trauma, injuries, 
throughout your experience here. Right? That is correct. Um, and does that include subdural hematomas? Uh, that would be correct. You've worked in emergency rooms? For about three decades. Okay, it's a long time. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and you dealt with how the head trauma there. That is correct. Okay. Um, I believe this is defense proposed exhibit number D. That's where I have it. Yes, sir. your experience, work history, and education, sir? Yes, it does. You know, at this time, we would like to move to admit uh, Dr. Rapp's uh, CV. From the no objection. Uh, to be received. And um, Dr. Rapp, you testified that you're a neurosurgeon, correct? Yes, sir. Can you tell me exactly what a neurosurgeon does in a sense? I know you testified at what it is, but what do you do in your practice? So in my practice, um, I work seven days a week. I have both office practice and hospital practice. So if somebody comes to me, for example, with a seizure, MRI shows that there's a tumor, then I examine them in the office, I go through the MRI results, and then I would schedule surgery. Then I have the surgical practice where I have my patients that I've operated on for both spinal cord trauma, herniated discs, and then brain surgery. Um, I also do outpatient surgery for like carpal tunnels and, and minor surgery. Uh, and then I'm on two weeks a month covering the emergency rooms, which is 24 hours, have to be there within 20 minutes. And in that type of situation, I would see a plethora of emergent or catastrophic neurosurgical problems, auto accidents, broken necks, subdural hematomas. And subdural hematomas occur with trauma, hockey playing, skiing, car accidents, slip and falls, and fights. Uh, uh, Dr. Rapp, do you know what a forensic pathologist is? Yes. Can you explain what a forensic pathologist is? 
a forensic pathologist is an individual who studies uh, post-mortem uh, findings. In other words, if there is a decedent or a death, they do the autopsy and they try to determine the cause of death. Can you, just, can you tell us what is the difference between you as a neurosurgeon and a, uh, a forensic pathologist? Well, one thing is volume. I see about 50 patients a day, and my patients are alive. The pathologist may do one or two, and I'm not really sure because it depends how active the city is, but they may do one or two autopsies a month, um, and they see people, or they see somebody who is now expired, so they don't see <clears throat> necessarily the uh, patient when they come in the emergency room. They don't have necessarily a complete history unless they've reviewed all the medical records. They may not have a full understanding of the care that was administered. Uh, and their opinions can be skewed because, for example, every subdural that a pathologist sees has died. Uh, the majority of subdurals that I see, most of them don't require surgery, and of those that require surgery, most of them survive. So I know that subdural hematomas uh, have about a 75% survival rate. If you talk about forensic pathologists, it's all doom and gloom because those patients are the ones that did not survive. So I have a different skew on the whole plethora of the disease. So the uh, uh, pathologist basically, with all due respect to that, looks at them when they're basically a past, correct? That is correct. And they try to predict as to what the uh, causes of death are at that particular moment. That is correct. While individuals such as yourself, Dr. Red, uh, see patients that are they're in, while they're alive. That is correct. Okay. And, and my job is to keep them that way. And your goal is to keep them alive, correct? Right? So, yes. And um, have you come across a number of subdural hematoma situations? I, in the last almost 40 years, I would say thousands because I'm on call in the ER. Um, some areas have a lot of trauma, like Pontiac. So I see a lot of head injuries, auto accidents, motorcycle accidents, falling off the bike, score injuries. So there's a, many subdurals. So this is uh, pretty common in your in your line of work, so to see as a girl who told us. Unfortunately, yes. Um, Judge, at this time, I would move to uh, admit Dr. Rapp as an expert witness uh, in neurosurgery. Mr. Sprezak, do you care to report your witness? No, Your Honor, we have no objection. All right. And he'll be uh, admitted as an expert, and I apologize. Which area did you ask for? Neurosurgery. As a neurosurgeon. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Rapp, were you asked to conduct an evaluation of the death of Dr. of Mr. Daniel Vasquez, sir? Yes, I was. And, and can you please explain what did you review in preparation for your evaluation of Mr. Vasquez? Uh, I evaluated the coroner's report, the toxicology report, um, video of the altercation at the bar, and post-mortem photographs at the, uh, at the autopsy. And then I've also had an opportunity to read more than 500 pages of the medical records. And you looked at the autopsy for the scars, Yes. So did you create a report after conducting the entire evaluation? Yes, I did. Judge, may I approach the wings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
of a rep of him, you have a document as proposed defense exhibit number D. Can you tell me? Uh, Did you say D? D, yeah. Uh, Very mark D. I'm sorry. D. 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 It's a D, D. Yes. D, I'm sorry. So let me. Uh, I file all this for you. Yes, sir. September 24, 2018, uh, into evidence and allow us to publish it to the jury. No objection. All right, will be received. Thank you. And Dr. Rep, I want to point your attention at this stage to Actually, a final conclusion uh, and that's on page three. Uh, first of all, is that your is that your signature, sir, at the end of, uh, on the end of page three? Yes, it is. And you indicated, sir, that quote, it is my opinion that it is medically impossible to conclude whether the specific punch of Mr. Wimpy that preceded the decedent's final fall caused or contributed to the death of Mr. Vasquez. You see that statement, sir? Yes, I do. Do you still hold that same as true today, sir? Yes, I do. All right. And can you tell me or tell the jury, sir, why do you believe that that's the case? Would you like me to go through the letter? Uh, please do, sir. I wish I could show you a, a diagram. I don't know if the jury has seen a diagram of the brain and the skull. So the brain fits into the skull, which is the bony cavity, like a hand fits Dr. in. Dr. Rep, for that point, they did see a number of pictures, but yes, please go ahead. If you want to bring up what the subdural looks like. So the brain fits inside the skull like a glove fits into a glove. I mean, hand fits into a glove. So when somebody is struck firmly, like falls to the ground, jars their head. The head actually moves inside the skull, and depending on other reasons, which I'm going to bring up in the letter, if the, if the head brain shrinks a little bit and the force is significant enough, then you can avulse or pull these draining veins from the surface of the brain that goes into one of the main channels. So when these veins are torn, there is a slow bleed. So a subdural doesn't wham form suddenly. It takes minutes, five, ten minutes, in some cases can take weeks, to form to a large enough size that it's now putting pressure on the brain and causing a patient to gradually become obtunded, unconscious, and collapse. So one of the contributing factors is, well, there are many contributing factors. One is age. Older people shrink. So their tissue shrink, the brain shrinks. So the brain now pulls away from the inside, so the glove is too big and there's movement. So when an older person falls, the brain moves a greater distance, giving it a greater opportunity for these draining veins to be pulled on and torn. So older people that fall have a greater chance of a subdural than a young person, for example, a football player. 
Another issue is that if somebody drinks, has hypertension, has other illnesses, this also leads to some brain atrophy. And large amounts of alcohol consumption, a few drinks a day, every day, uh, the brain itself becomes a little bit softer. And in that sense, if a younger person actually develops a bleed as this blood starts to form, the brain is so firm that it will hold back the formation of the blood clot and the bleeding stops. In an older brain or brain that's atrophic, diseased, hypertension, drinking, medication, that when the blood starts to form, the brain is more like a soft sponge and it will accommodate the blood and continue to shift, allowing the blood to fill to a larger extent and then that pressure causes the problem. So unfortunately, Mr. Vasquez uh, had a blood alcohol, I think, of 0.14, and apparently has a um, daily or weekly consumption of alcohol. Uh, he is hypertensive. He is, um, I believe, has had prior head injuries for two reasons. One, he's on Keppra, which is a seizure medicine, why are you on seizure medicine? Because you've had injury. Uh, the CT scan of the facial bone showed old fractures, nothing that happened at this fight. The nose was fractured in the past. The orbit was fractured in the past. The ethmoid bones had two fractures. So you have a gentleman who's 59, hypertensive, <coughs> has alcohol use, marijuana use, um, I'm concerned that there was also narcotics in the system, fentanyl, oxycontin, um, has prior trauma. This is sort of a setup of an unhealthy brain that doesn't tolerate even minor injury well. And we know that for a fact that even minor injury in certain people can lead to this avulsion. So that was one, in, one concern that I had. Right. Dr. Wright, uh, can you tell us uh, fentanyl? Okay, you so there's a trace of fentanyl in this system, correct? So this is disturbing to me because I cannot, you cannot prescribe a pill for fentanyl. So what we're seeing now in the news and in uh, the newspaper all the time, this opioid epidemic. And for example, Prince, the musician, died of a fentanyl overdose but he didn't know he was taking fentanyl. He took somebody's Percocet, but they were counterfeit. They were made by China or someplace else, and the narcotic is cut with fentanyl. The problem is fentanyl is an extremely strong narcotic, about 10 times the potency of morphine, and maybe 100 times the potency of Demerol. So even a little bit of fentanyl can cause people to become unconscious, to stop breathing, it won't happen to prints. So to have fentanyl in your system uh, is suggestive that you're taking drugs that are not prescribed to. And just to be clear, um, Dr. Wright, you can't get fentanyl. A doctor doesn't prescribe correct? And the, and, only the, and, the, and the out of the hospital context. The only way you can get fentanyl is usually by an anesthesiologist at surgery. There are some uh, rare uh, patches that you can put on the individual in chronic pain management, but in the autopsies I didn't see any, I saw pictures of the decedent's body, there were no evidence of any uh, fentanyl patches on it. So it does lead me to be quite concerned that there's other things going on in his health. No, I think mean that they may, uh, this is possibly a street drug that he That's what I'm trying to find, yes. Unless he was in the hospital and they received that fentanyl from a doctor at the hospital. It's like for an operation. Okay. What? So again, someone can slip and fall and go home and tell his wife, hey, I slipped and fell at work two hours ago. And then later that night, they can start to become obtundent, have nausea, vomiting, headache, and then collapse. Someone can, uh, can collapse on a football field after being hit really hard, go back to the, the, the bench and then tell the coach I have a headache and collapse. Some people can have a subdural that can take months, called a chronic subdural, to collapse. So the point that I'm trying to bring at is that in the video, Mr. Vasquez actually was not fell to the ground, but thrown to the ground by a different patron. You can see him holding him and then throwing him. 
And if you watch, two things are particularly interesting. His head does strike on the right side, and it bounces. I mean, you can see it just bounce. And then he slowly get up, and he's somewhat uncoordinated. So it looks like he's concussed. And to me, that represents a very serious blow to the head, more so than a quick jab to the jaw. And it's also fun, Doctor. Did you see any evidence of a uh, a fracture in the jaw? There was no fracture of the mandible or the jaw. Was there a fracture on the right side of the maxilla, which is the upper part of the right side of the, uh, of the face? There was a fracture, a linear fracture, on the right side of the maxilla, which I believe was caused by this fall, further substantiating that that was a significant fall. I mean, a great amount of energy was delivered to his head at that fall. So the point is, when he developed that fall, I believe that's a strong possibility where these veins were torn and the clock starts to tick and the subdural is gradually starting to fall, I mean, develop. But he can get up, he can still function, and of course there's a lot of commotion going on in that bar, so he's going to stay somewhat focused. And, and Dr. Can you explain to the jury the subdural habitoma? Is, is it something that, let's assume you get struck, is something that automatically happens and, and, and it's right there then and just knocks you out and causes uh, damage to your brain? Or can you please explain that? that no, people can be knocked out from a concussion without having an intracranial bleed. Boxers, uh, people slip and fall on the ice, they get seen in the emergency room, they do a CAT scan, there's no bleed, they wake up, they get sent home. Uh, so a subdural takes time to develop, three, five minutes, 10 minutes, for a relatively significant bleed with many vessels being torn, or even up to hours uh, after an injury. Uh, so it's sort of like a smoking gun. You've had a serious head injury, that you know, because it hurts like the Dickens, but you don't realize that you have this slow hemorrhage that is starting to develop, pushing your brain from one side to the other, and when it does push it to a certain point that there's significant intracranial pressure, you become unconscious. But before you become unconscious, you'll be experiencing headache, nausea, uh, blurred vision, maybe even a seizure. Okay. And is it possible, Dr. Rapp, that an individual that suffered subdural hem uh, hematoma could have happened 10 minutes before? When before they collapse? Absolutely. You need time for this blood clot to develop. Okay. Is it possible that it could have happened six hours before? Well, it's interesting. He's on Kepra. I don't know when he was placed on Kepra. So he could have had a fight two, three days ago. And again, it took two, three days to form this very large subdural. You, you just can't get a blood clot forming that quickly in a matter of seconds. So is it, in a sense, as if you're, how should I say, um, and I know it's probably a bad description, but you're filling up a, a, a water balloon, say, <coughs> with water, and it just keeps getting, getting, it gets to a certain stage where, I know in the, in the subdural hematoma, it kind of shifts, pushes pressure on the rest of the brain to shift to a different, uh, different area, causing the unconscious. Actually, that's pretty good likeness. The subdural is a collection of fluid and it's forming slowly. So the, I, I said that, Doctor. It's a, it's, it's a collection of fluid. Correct. So, and the fluid doesn't just go, I, I mean, it's yeah. not just immediate. It's Judge, just I'm going to object to the leading question. I'm going to be sustained. We'll be allowed to rephrase it. If we can, just one at a time for the report. Right. Thank you. <coughs> In your experience, Doc, I know you said probably have thousands of these. Uh, it, it doesn't just, does it just form right away in reference to that question? pressure on the brain? It does not. It has to gradually inflate. So as it's forming, it's taking up the room inside that glove where your finger should be. It's taking up the room inside the skull where your brain should be. And since the brain now is soft, it's allowing the balloon to inflate, which means the brain is being forcefully shoved to the opposite side, and it's not a good thing for the brain. And that could happen over hours? Again, minutes, hours, days, 
in products of girls actually take months. Usually months. Right. So he could have had an altercation last week and that subdural was still forming or now you have a large mass. Judge, I'm going to object. He's speculating. There's no evidence for it. He testifies to the process causes subdural I am going to sustain the objection. However, once again, can we rephrase your question and continue? Okay. Um, is it possible for this decedent to have had an incident that would cause a subdural hematoma weeks ahead of time before the incident happened? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. I'm sorry. So again, Judge, I'm going to object. There's no question. Mr. Right. You're going to have to ask another question. Okay. You, you can't just go ahead. Okay. Um, well, could alcohol play a role in that, uh, Dr. Yes, as I stated earlier, alcohol over time will cause the brain not only to atrophy somewhat, allowing more room for more motion, which allows more of a stretch to these blood vessels, but it also makes the brain somewhat softer, so it will allow the subdural hematoma to form, whereas a younger or healthier brain would resist it and wouldn't allow that balloon that you mentioned to inflate. Okay. Now, you've worked at the UR for over three decades now, correct? Correct. Right. And you've seen thousands of subdural hematomas, correct? Yes. Uh, please tell us, what is the procedure to address the subdural hematoma? Well, obviously the patient comes to the emergency room, take a history, and you perform physical examination. When one suspects that there's a head injury or something neurologically abnormal, you usually get a CAT scan. Then you have the judgment is the CAT scan. I'm sorry, doctor. Why do you do a CAT scan? Oh, I'm sorry. CAT scan is a very fancy x-ray. Most people know about it now, where it allows me to actually see the inside of the brain. It would be inside of the skull. So I can see, is there swelling, is there a bleed, or is there a tumor or something else going on? So in the case that you're trying to describe, you would then see a blood clot inside the brain. And there are three types of blood clots. Probably there's no exam after this. <laughs> the three types of blood clots are the most common, which is the subdural. The very delicate veins are a bolster torn, they slowly bleed, forming a clot between the inside of the skull and the brain. But Dr. Owens, you said that is the most common form of... Yes. There's another type of bleed called an epidural hematoma, which is a blood clot that forms between the skull and the dura, or the covering of the brain. And the third type is when there's a hemorrhage directly in the tissue of the brain. So it's not on it, but actually in the substance of the brain itself. And that's called an intraparenchymal bleed, and that's a very serious bleed. Okay. And then there's also bleeds through the strokes. So tell me, Doc, uh, what, is, what is the procedure that you would conduct in order to uh, try and save this individual uh, from a subdural hematoma? So if I noticed that the individual had a large mass collection of blood, significantly shifting the brain over, then I would need to do several things. I would have to do what's called a craniotomy, which is an operation where we actually remove a portion of the bone, open the covering of the brain called the dura, and evacuate or flush out this large clot, allowing the brain to come back to its normal position. I usually would leave the bone flap out you can make a little pocket, a little tummy, so that it stays sterile and bring it back two, three, four months down the road and the brain swelling's down and return the bone flap out. Because if you put the bone flap back in, even though you took the blood clot out, the brain swelling can then cause pressure. So it's better to let the brain swell outside without having this uh, skull on. And then I would put what's called an EVD or an, ex an external ventricular drainage, which is a little catheter that goes inside the center of the brain, which is hollow, to not only monitor the pressure, but to allow removal of cerebral spinal fluid, which will also decrease the volume or pressure inside that. 
Um, do you know whether that process was conducted in this particular case on Mr. Westwood's? Yes, it was. And um, do you know whether the, from looking at the autopsy pictures, do you know whether the, uh, the, the drainage of the blood or the spinal fluid was uh, completely completed before they put the, uh, the uh, how, I'm going to use a layman, sort of sewed it back up on the brain, brain area? Well, when I do surgery, I evacuate the clot and I put a drain in. The post-mortem x-rays of the picture showed that the clot reformed, and I don't believe they reoperated to remove the clot that reformed. And um, can you reoperate to remove the clot that was formed? Yes, you should, because sometimes when it reforms, it's actually larger than the first time. Now, Doctor, uh, you had an opportunity to look at the, uh, the autopsy pictures, correct, sir? Yes, I did. Okay. And this is a document that's already been uh, admitted into evidence. If I may, now I present a court of witness. It's by which exhibit? That's yeah. exhibit, uh, defense exhibit C. Okay, thank you. Doctor Rapp, I'm having you look at defendant's exhibit number C that's already been admitted into evidence. Yes. Um, can you please tell me, sir, uh, what that document is? This is a color photograph of a cross-section of a Mr. Vasquez's brain. It's actually a slice so they can see what went on in the inside because a forensic pathologist needs to look at everything. See it up on the screen, uh, Dr. Rapp? Yes, I can. Okay. And can you please describe to the jury what that is? Obviously, that's the uh, that's the brain of the of the deceased. Uh, can you please explain to them has it been kind of cut in the middle or cut as to see what the be process? So there are other cuts that will demonstrate this as well because this is about an inch large. This location of the brain is called the basal ganglion, and this is a classic routine, run-of-the-mill, frequently seen stroke. In other words, individuals that are diabetic, hypertensive, um, over smoking, COPD, they get very brittle blood vessels, atherosclerosis. And these vessels, being brittle, do not tolerate sudden fluctuations in blood pressure, and they do not tolerate elevated blood pressure. So people can die from strokes where they have an elevated pressure, blood vessel bursts, and then they collapse. Where do these occur? Most commonly in the basal ganglion. And this is a classic hypertensive basal ganglion bleed. And my feeling is that during the commotion of fighting, your blood pressure goes up because you're very excited. And this these little vessels bled, and this is what we commonly see. If you notice, there's no swelling or edema or any vector of any force, so this is not traumatic. And you don't see intraparenchymal traumatic bleeds in the basal ganglion like this because of its location. There's nothing firm that can traumatize it inside, so this is un I mean, this is unrelated to the trauma. This is related to his generalized health. He's had a stroke. What concerned me is that the pathologist called this a brown spot. And I was sort of offended by that because somebody so educated to have done a fellowship in forensic pathologist should have said that he had a stroke and called it such and not try to cover it up. No. No objection, Your Honor. We sustain the jury be ordered disregard. It'll be stricken. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Now, Dr. Rapp, um, you said this is in the area of the brain that's called a, and I apologize for my literacy as to the medical terminology, but um, basal ganglion. Uh, ganglion. Right? And is that an important part of the brain, sir? Yes. The brain stem is the central computer of the brain. So just like, for example, General Motors has 
thousands of offices with computers, they're all connected to the mainframe. So if any one computer has coffee spilt on it, the mainframe is still functioning. So the hemisphere is the multiple computers, but they all funnel down to the brainstem. So any damage to the brainstem is a very serious injury. This is a very eloquent portion of the brain. It controls our breathing, it controls our heart rate, our respirations, and it controls our levels of consciousness. So when the brainstem is injured, uh, this is a life-threatening uh, event. So would you say, Doctor, that the basal uh, ganglion area is uh, one of the uh, most important parts of the brain? As a neurosurgeon, I like to think of the whole brain as being important. I don't want to miss any portion, but I would say it's very important because it's one of the eloquent portions of the brain. You cannot survive without it. Oh. And uh, a stroke in that area of the brain, sir, is that dangerous? Extremely dangerous. There is a high mortality, definitely a high morbidity. In other words, people with a basal ganglion stroke, if they survive, will be left fairly devastated, loss of speech, loss of function to a certain half of the body, loss of sight on that side of the body. Um, and the death rate is very high, approaching 80% or more. And immortality? Immortality, yes. Uh, what about the subdural hemorrhage? Do you know what the percentage is of Subdural about 75% survival. So there's a 75% survival rate of a subdural hemorrhage. Correct. And there's literally a 13 or 15% survival rate of a stroke such as this in the uh, basal thing. Yes. Obviously a much more severe situation than the subdural hemorrhage. It's more severe because the subdural is not an injury into the brain. It's an injury that causes bleeding, and it's the bleeding that's putting pressure on a normal brain, or an unhealthy brain, but a functional brain. Whereas a hypertensive bleed is an injury to the substance, the neurons, the cells of the brain that are telling you how to live. So it actually is an internal injury to the most eloquent portion of the brain. And is it your testimony, sir, that uh, considering you looked at the videotapes, sir, you looked at the autopsy photos in the coroner's report, is it your opinion, sir, that this particular uh, stroke to the brain uh, was caused by the uh, fight that was conducted on January 31st? A fight or trauma to the brain cannot cause the bleed in this area. It has to Anytime there's an intraperitheal bleed, something has to be pushed into the brain. So the brain is supported by what's called the tentorium. The edges are very, very firm, it's like falling against the table. So if the head is struck in a certain way, the brain can bump up against that edge of the table or tentorium and cause bleeds in the periphery. So an internal bleed cannot happen with trauma. And when one sees a hypertensive bleed in the basal ganglion, it's a very obvious, common, it's like looking at a photo of you and your parents know, yeah, that's you. So when I look at this, I know that's a hypertensive basal ganglion bleed. It's a stroke. And for a subdural hematoma, Dr. Rath, you would agree that uh, most of the pressure will be on the outside layers of the brain, like in, in these types of areas, correct, sir? On the surface, yes. On the surface. And this happens to be inside the surface, correct, sir? In the substance, the cells themselves. So it's just not a brown spot? Uh, no, a brown spot, there's no medical term that I've ever read as a brown spot. This represents a hypertensive hemorrhagic stroke. Judge, may we approach, please? On record, watch. Oh, off record. Oh, sorry, Judge. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So this stroke could have been started way before the fight even happened. It could have, but it, a hemorrhage in that area would lead to a rapid loss of consciousness. Dr. Rapp, you were able to review the coroner's report as well as the autopsy photos. Did you see any kind of fracture to the back of the, def the deceased uh, head? There was actually no skull fractures whatsoever, except for this maxillary fracture. Okay. So when you fell backwards, the last punch that Mr. Wimpy did, um, there was no fracture in the back of his head? Two things. The way he collapsed, he sort of folded, and I don't believe they had really struck the grounds that they did. I didn't really see it struck, strike it soundly. There was no, not only was there no fracture, I didn't really see much bruising in that area in the post mortem picture. And in your experience, Doctor, people get knocked out all the time, correct? I say loss of consciousness is one of the most common ER counsels because they don't really feel comfortable discharging them, yet there are not enough problems to admit them. So they're observed, CAT scans negative, they get sent home. And I sort of believe that if he didn't get shoved to the ground earlier and had the subdural start at that time, being hit in the jaw, knocked out, he probably should have just gradually come to, come to in the hospital, but not have a bleed. It didn't seem that forceful, in my opinion. Um, Doc, do you, uh, you looked at the toxicology report, sir, correct? Yes. All right, and uh, there was uh, some medication Keppra, what is that type of medicine, sir? Keppra is an anti-seizure medication. Is that indicative of uh, prior brain injury, sir? It could be. It's indicative of either prior seizure disorder or prior trauma or injury. on your way home, I suggest stopping at Tony Paco's if you like hot dogs. And I do. All right, so, <clears throat> Doctor, um, are you familiar with the Glasgow Coma Scale? Yes, I am. All right, and can you describe for the jury what that is? Glasgow Coma Scale is a scale where we judge movement, verbal response, and eye response. Three simple things and then we can grade the individual on how they respond to uh, each of those inquiries. Uh, a normal is 15, very bad is 3. And he came in with a 3. He came in with a 3, so, he, so Mr. Vasquez came in very bad. I would say yes. All right. Now, uh, if you look at the first page of your report, <coughs> second paragraph, you uh, describe the items that you reviewed prior to your testimony, correct? Correct. Uh, and you indicated the coroner's report, toxicology report, autopsy photos, and the video, correct? Correct. Uh, however, you testified that you also reviewed the medical records, correct? That is correct. But that's not included in your report? Uh, two issues. One, I discussed the medical condition with his attorneys on the phone. And the coroner's report mentions the uh, review the medical records, and then I had them sent to my office afterwards. It okay, took so you reviewed the medical records after drafting this report? Uh, personally reviewed them after, but verbally discussed them with the attorney prior. Okay. So I had a pretty decent understanding of what happened. Okay. 
So why don't we do this? Um, so we can get through all this together. I have the medical record if I can approach the witness. This is uh, State's Exhibit 13. And then I also have the toxicology report, which is in State's Exhibit 16. So I'm going to set these here, and then we can kind of work through this stuff together, OK? All right. Now, the first, one of the first issues that uh, you addressed in your direct exam is uh, the consumption of alcohol and how that can impact the brain and brain injuries, correct? Yes, sir. And you referred to the defendant, or excuse me, Mr. Vasquez, as having a blood alcohol content of 0.14. Is that accurate? Correct. If you uh, look at State's Exhibit 16, which is on top of the medical records, that's the toxicology report, right? Correct. And you see where it says ethanol? Yes. And it says 0.14? Yes. Right? What does it say under the um, column sample? I'm not sure what you're indicating. You There's what? a column that says drug, result, units, and sample. This is the fourth column. Okay. What does it say in the uh, line for ethanol? Wait a second. It says urine, correct? I don't see where it says urine on your shelf. Second approach. I see all this here. Okay, I see it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So that's urine, correct? Correct. Right. And that's different than blood alcohol content, is it not? Yes, it would be. So you're offering an opinion based upon a 0.14 BAC, but that's not actually what Mr. Baskett has had in the system because this is a urine sample. So two issues. One, to get into the urine to have it be in the blood. So the blood concentration should be much higher than the urine concentration. Also, there's a certain amount of time that the blood is going to be processed. I recognize that, but that's not what you said in your report, correct? That would be an error. That is an error. Okay. All right. Now, let's talk about prior brain injury. Um, you indicated that uh, Keppra is uh, generally prescribed to individuals that have uh, some type of a seizure disorder. Is that correct? Correct. All right. Can you, since I know it'll take you a second, go to page 182 of the medical record. Page 182, doctor? 182. All right. And does it list the uh, past medical history of the patient? talks about past surgical history, correct? That is correct. And that includes a uh, coronary angioplasty in 2008? Correct. And a tooth extraction from January 29th of 2018, is that correct? Correct. So it doesn't say anything in his past medical history of having a prior brain injury, does it? Uh, can I just expound on that, Pat? I'm just asking a specific question. Does it say that or not? Mr. Vasquez never told them anything, so I'm not really sure where they obtained this. And is it complete? Well, I know Mr. Vasquez in the same thing. Right, so we're not just information. Hold on, I'm so sorry. One at a time. Question first, then okay. answer. Well, if you if you had reviewed the medical records, you would realize that they obtained it, uh, past medical history from family members that were right. So this okay. is obtained three days after his admission. Okay. So obviously, if you read all the medical records, I'm sure you had. In the beginning, it says unknown, unknown, unknown. So I don't know if they, like if somebody asked my sister what my past medical history is, they may not know I have, they may know I have my appendix out, but they may not know I've had stents put in. 
So I don't know how intimate he is with his family members and the HIPAA people can see a lot of things. So this is probably incomplete because I don't really see all the medications that he's on. So well, this well, is a good start, but I don't think you can rule out. Well, why don't we go to go to page 201? Yes, sir. All right, and there's a section in there that talks about what her, uh, Mr. Vasquez has had a history of seizures. What does that say? I can approach. Okay. You According to that page, doctor, the uh, treating physicians at the time note that he did not have a history of seizures. Is that correct? Page 33 and 54. The third of the mess records? Yes. Seizures can be caused by a traumatic brain injury, correct? Yes, it can. And traumatic brain injury can be caused by blunt force trauma to the head, correct? That's correct. All right. And one of the ways to treat that particular condition would be um, the use of Keppra, correct? Correct. All right. Um, can you go to page five of the medical records, please? Doctor, there's a little bit of a chart, or a small chart, excuse me, that uh, lists medications that were administered to Mr. Vasquez uh, on January 31st of 2018. Uh, can you read what was fentanyl uh, provided to him? Yes. And at what time? I believe 135. And what about Keppra? At 219 in the morning. And was uh, fentanyl given more than once? Yes. All right, and what other time was fentanyl provided? Uh, doctor, you discussed uh, uh, reviewing the toxicology report, correct? Yes. And some of your opinions regarding um, the uh, interaction of the drugs and how it could have impacted Mr. Vasquez's brain at the time of the incident is based off your review of the toxicology report, correct? Correct. Right. Are you aware 
at the time the, the uh, blood draw that was submitted to the coroner's office from the hospital. I believe there was a toxicotic or a blood a urine screen on, on admission. Mm -hmm. uh, they do that. But I do realize that there was drugs given while in the hospital. I assumed or thought that the blood screen and urine samples were taken on admission mm -hmm. before the gas came. There was testimony from the chief forensic toxicologist that the blood sample used during the toxicology report was uh, received or taken at 6 a.m. on January 31st, 2018. So that would be after he had been administered doses of keprone and fentanyl, correct? That would be correct. So then you're not in a position to say that the Mr. Vasquez had fentanyl or cupra in his system prior to admission to the hospital because they actually gave it to him as a course of treatment, correct? That would definitely be part of the, uh, the toxicology report. It's there. I don't know who gave it. Either the patient himself or the hospital, but not that the hospital is making sure that he gets these traces of it. Okay. So my, my point is it's difficult for you to opine on whether those substances impacted his brain injury because he was administered the drugs after admission to the hospital, correct? It would require me to know what he was taking before. I assumed he was taking before because it was in his blood system. If the hospital also gives it or gave it, then you can't really tell. All right, so some of your opinion is based off of assumption then, is what you're, what you're telling the jury, correct? And I have to say yes. Okay. Now, we talked about we talked about uh, treatment that would be received. Um, Mr. Vasquez, there was a CAT scan uh, at, that was uh, taken when he was uh, brought in, and that would be normal based off of the fact that there's a head injury, correct? That is correct. So at that point, you're taking a CAT scan to determine what you're dealing with, right? That is correct. Because you're not going to want to put yourself in a position where you're going to go into the operating room blind, right? You wouldn't know what to do. Right. <clears throat> now, the CAT scan would be capable of identifying a stroke potentially, correct? In this type of situation, no, because the brain is being so compressed, you're not going to get with the Also, you may not see the stroke initially. Okay. But, and that's, and that's fair enough, that's, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, that's what I asked. Um, but if you go to page 259, um, it talks about, I'll, I'll wait for it, I'm sorry. There's a segment called Patient Active Problem List. And it's, yeah. Yes, sir. Or, no, 269, I'm sorry, that's my fault. Yeah. I apologize, no problem. Try not to drop it. So we have uh, Patient Active Problem List dated 131.18. Okay. Um, and then at that point, the stroke had not been identified, correct? That is correct. All right. Um, if you go to page 246, now no, we're backtracking. Okay. And off the record, it'd be nice if they provided things in chronological order. That's easier for me. I'm but trying to. It, it, no, not not you. Okay. I'm saying the hospital. It's not your fault. Um, there is mention that there is a cerebral infarct, correct. and that's, that's a stroke, correct? Or, okay, so that is an ischemic stroke, not due to hemorrhage, but due to the pressure applied to the brain. So with all the swelling and the pressure of the subdural, that's why people become unconscious. Just like if you put pressure on your nail bed, goes from pink to white, it's white because there's no blood flow. So if you put pressure on the brain and shove it to one side long enough, there's no blood flow. No blood flow in the brain in about four minutes causes 
death of cells, and that's a stroke. So yes. So that, that, that's an ischemic stroke. Is no, what you're that's, that is a stroke caused by no blood flow, whereas the stroke we see in the basal ganglion is due to ruptured blood vessels hemorrhaging into the brain. Okay. Both are stroke, strokes. One's ischemic, one's hemorrhagic. All right. And the other issue, but, is, um, when, when you see the stroke on the film, excuse me, on the postmortem, it's there. You don't see it on the CAT scans. Well, CAT scan's not reading it, or they missed, they didn't see it, and it's, I haven't seen the CAT scan. So either it didn't show up during the compression, or it's there, the radiologist missed it, because we know it's there, because we see it in the postmortem slice. And people don't have a stroke after they expire. Correct. And, and obviously a stroke has been identified in the medical records, right? I mean, that's what we're talking right. about. The two different right. strokes, two different issues. One is the stroke due to the pressure of the subdural, okay. the swelling of the brain. One due to the excitement of the fight leading to hypertension, leading to a rupture of blood vessels within the brain. Well, you're operating under the assumption that the excitement of the fight did cause it. You don't have any evidence to say that's the case, correct? Well, I'm saying that the patient had a hypertensive stroke. And I know the patient lost consciousness in the bar. That a felt called the patient. My feeling is that you have a stroke that can cause loss of consciousness mm -hmm. and a sudden demise of the patient, which I see. And I know a subdural takes time to form and a more violent force to the head is when he was thrust to the ground, his head bouncing violently. Okay. And that's how usually subdurals are formed. Okay. But there is another type of stroke that was identified, and, per, and you, we've discussed that, and that could be the result of traumatic brain injury, correct? Yes. That stroke is not due to direct trauma, but is a secondary trauma due to pressure. So there's lack of blood flow during pressure. If you notice the reports that he had herniation, subfalcial herniation. So the brain I'm sorry, he had herniation. Subfalcial, I think, else. Yeah, I know. In other words, the brain shifts under the faults, and that puts tremendous pressure on the brain. There's no blood flow. So one occurs as the um, sequela of trauma develops due to pressure, and not due to hypertension or blood vessel right. rupture. So that stroke could have actually contributed to the death as well, correct? I think everything builds up. Once you've had a significant subdural brain shift, craniotomy, craniotomy that left more blood in the brain, and then the ventriculostomy actually caused a hemorrhage position that put the catheter into the brain. It was a hemorrhage along the track. That was devastating too, but that also is in the parenchyma or substance of the brain. So there's a lot of things here that unfortunately caused the demise of these capacitors. Not just simple jab to the jaw. Okay, well, let's. Why don't we look at the at the punches? Because you keep referring this to the jab. Okay, and we can talk about subdural hematomas. I believe is State's Exhibit 12B. All right, so there's Mr. Wimpy first throws Mr. Vasquez to the floor. Well, that was not a throw. He slipped. Okay, well, that's, we can have a difference of opinion, but now we just saw that he landed a four-punch combination, correct? Would you like me to play that again for you? Sure.
All right, so, so you're saying he slipped and it was not aided by Mr. Wimpy and going to the ground? I mean, they're in a tassel. <coughs> he pushes him, he goes to the ground. Rather than being thrown to the ground, I think there is a difference. Okay. Okay. Well, let's look at this now. Okay. okay. Now, what do you think about that? Um, Did that cause a head injury? The last punch hit his shoulder. I saw one punch hit the face. So he said it was four every time he threw it two. So he threw four punches. Okay. Well, if it didn't hit his head, I mean, he used the shoulder to block him. All right, but he did connect with his face. Yeah, correct? there was one. And if you connect with somebody's face, that can cause jarring of the brain, correct? That is true. And you've already testified that somebody who is older, their tissue tends to shrink a little bit, right? So that's going to cause the brain to move around a little more, correct? <coughs> correct. All right. So now let's go to camera angle number five. on the right side of the screen, there's Mr. Wimp with his arms extended and there's Mr. Vasquez. Now, that punch sent Mr. Vasquez to the floor, okay? Would you characterize that as a jab? No, I didn't see this one. All right, okay. and could that have caused a subdural hematoma? Well, virtually any punch can cause an injury. So I'm just basing it on the one that I saw was the most forceful. All right. Now I want you to pay attention to Mr. Vasquez as, as he walks away. Do you see him grabbing his head there? And he's a little wobbly, right? Yes. And that's immediately after being punched by Mr. Wimpy and knocked to the floor, is it not? Yes, that's true. So at that point, is he showing signs of a head injury? Well, is this after? He was thrown to the floor by a different patron. It is after he was thrown to the floor. So, again, there is the possibility that the more violent thrust to the floor by the other patron initiated the bleed. And now this is just a secondary blow to the original blow that I think caused the bleed. So if you're characterizing him being thrown to the floor as being more violent than what we just saw Mr. Wimpy do. Can you show that, please? The throw? Yeah. Sure, I can show that. Because I believe you see the head actually bouncing. <coughs> uh, so when someone punches, your head's going to go the opposite direction to avoid it. But when you strike a floor, the floor is unyielding. Well, when you put on the camera angle, you can't see whether his head hits the floor because he goes straight down, correct? That is true, so, so I can't comment. I'm sorry, on the camera angle? His head that. could have hit the floor, and you have no idea, correct? But it is wrong to the floor, as you're going to see in this first one. And then, with this angle, there was an episode that he's off camera where there's a scuffle, and I don't know who hit or kicked him as well. So it's kind of difficult to blame Mr. Wimpy when all this commotion is going on. If you're saying it's difficult to blame Mr. Wimpy for contributing to causing a head injury to the man that he punched in the face? Is that really your testimony? I think Mr. Wimpy was defending himself. He Objection, Your Honor. Okay. What is the, the, the objection to be sustained? The uh, jurors will disregard the last comment. Doctor, you're stricken from the record. Go ahead. Doctor, you're not in a position where you're offering a comment. Okay, we're talking about head injury, <coughs> all right? You're going to tell the jury that Mr. Wimpy's punches to the head, knocking Mr. Vasquez to the floor, did that cause the significant, have a significant cause the, for the head injury? I don't believe so. Because yes, he made contact to the head. Mr. Vasquez is appropriately defending himself, raises his shoulder, one of the punches strikes the body, not the head. After he's hit, he steps back and trips, but he's not grabbed firstly by the shoulders and thrown against the ground, which you'll see. Do we need to look at camera angle number five again? I see him hit mm -hmm. and backing out of the camera. And because he's falling to the floor. You don't see the head strike the floor. I understand that, but 
I was he he's doing knock to the floor, is he not? He could have landed on his buttocks. I didn't see what happened after he takes a few steps back, but you're speculating as well. I'm not speculating, I'm let's asking say, whether he could have I'm asking whether he could have done one at a time. And I do think there is a possibility a little bit of confusion. If you could show the clip again what you're referring to so we can all get on the same page. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is Cam Rangel, number five again. All right, pay attention on the left side of the screen. see that he was grabbing his head after that punch, correct? Yes. All right, and that right there is a physical indicator that he has suffered a head injury at, at some point in, during this altercation, correct? Objection, speculation. It's a question. Your objections are ruled. You can answer one way or the other. Can you back up one more time? I mean, he, 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 I don't see him grabbing his head. I see him with one hand adjusting his hair. Yes, it does look like he's grabbing his hand, but you really can't say that. You never see his head strike anything because it's out of the view of the camera. So it's very limited what you can. Well, let's watch it again and we'll watch what he's doing here. Okay, so it falls on his left side. I should say right side. All right, the right side is where all the injuries are, aren't they? But his head doesn't hit, we don't see his head hitting the ground. I understand that, but the injuries are on the right side, correct? Then why is he touching the left side of his head when he struck the right side? That's a so great question. I'd like to know that. You're, well, you're I, the nurse. I, think he's, he's, I just think he's just adjusting his hair. That's what he's done. He's not grabbing his head. He's got not both hands, just the one. And we never see his head.